All right, so as Chad said, you know, we used to work at Cloudera together, and you know, this morning it feels a little bit like Cloudera reunion because you know, he certainly talked about all this stuff that really sort of matters to me, and a lot of the sort of background and bring up that I had in Puppet comes from the experience that we shared, you know, uh, attending Puppet training, which is great, loved it. Uh, and we kind of like come from this similar background. He is right. I mean, I still uh, do have way more servers to manage. You know, the number of servers is growing. So for those of you who don't know, Cloudera is uh, one of the top commercial providers of the Hadoop and Hadoop ecosystem projects. Uh, so we have to test that puppy at scale. And we really try to make the best uh, out of, you know, the hardware resources that we get. So today, uh, my talk will not be so much about, you know, giving you sort of a high truth about, you know, how to deploy Hadoop so that you can come back and say to your management, now I know how to deploy Hadoop. That thing is great. Let's deploy it. I'm actually much more interested in sort of giving you an overview of what's happening with the Hadoop and more general with deployment of distributed systems. I call them strongly distributed systems and I will talk about what it means. It's a little bit different from you know, the typical sort of application of the puppet, uh, but let me actually talk a little bit about you know, who I am and you know, sort of where I'm coming from. So again, an open source software developer, not so much uh, a DevOps person or a system administrator. And that'll show because again, like I do have part of my job, which is supporting you know, sort of God honest you know, IT department type of a situation where you know, servers just need to work. But most of the time, I actually spend on the Apache uh, Software Foundation project called BigTop, which is meant to be the sort of this foundation of the building of Hadoop distributions. And again, I'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, before I jump into it, for those of you who are unfamiliar with what Hadoop and especially the Hadoop ecosystem is, let me just walk you through very, very briefly what's out there, right? What do we have to deal with when we talk about you know, Hadoop systems and how to deploy Hadoop system and that sort of thing? So there is tons of components. And on this slide, I have a Zookeeper, you know, which is kind of like this all-encompassing coordinator that every single component uses. You know, there is HDFS, which is essentially a distributed file system. You could think of it as a you know, replacement for your NAS you know, sort of thing, right? Uh, there is HBase, which is a uh, you know, big table-like implementation on top of HDFS. Uh, NoSQL database guys you know, will recognize the name. Uh, there is a scheduler, uh, actually two types of scheduling depending on how you look at it. So there is a very fundamental scheduler uh, in terms of Yarn and MapReduce, and there is a high-level scheduler, Uzi. You could call it coordinator if you, wa if you want. And then there are you know, all these sort of leaf node components that comprise you know, the biggest portion of the Hadoop ecosystem that actually utilize the fundamental services to provide you something that you're already familiar with. So Hive is a good example. Hive is an attempt to provide a SQL-like capabilities on top of the data that you have in HDFS. So Impala, the project that Cloudera uh, is uh, you know, putting forward and you know, we sort of take great pride in uh, making it open source uh, this year, actually last year, uh, is sort of a different attempt at providing you know, SQL-like capabilities more geared towards real-time uh, querying as opposed to Hive, which is more geared towards you know, batch-oriented MapReduce type of querying. Then there is a Pig, which is a different you know, take on uh, data query language. There's a whole bunch of the components. And in fact, you know, on this slide, I actually reduced the number of components by at least 50% you know, compared to what we actually have to deal with. So, how do they depend on each other? Well, in all sorts of ways. I mean, it's really, really, really difficult to predict you know, what will affect what and you know, what are the uh, right ways to deploy it. It's not as straightforward as with just you know, deploying a bunch of HTTPD servers you know, behind the common load balancer. And even that is a challenge, right? So it is a jungle out there. I mean, this is the entire list of components that you have to worry about when you talk about the Hadoop cluster being run in your organization. Again, granted, you know, some of them you probably won't use, but if you're a company you know, like Facebook or eBay or Yahoo, I guarantee you, you will care about every single one of these guys, right? And it's a huge list. Just you know, understanding how, how it all fits together is a pretty big problem. So what's the answer? What's the answer to a typical DevOps person, right? You know, what's the answer to somebody who just wants to deploy it and have a running, you know, fully functioning Hadoop cluster and all these projects, you know, uh, around it. 
Well, when I started, I thought that the answer would be, you know, it's simple, it's Puppet Forge. So it must be something available, you know, on the Puppet Forge today. Uh, so you should go to the Puppet Forge, download the, you know, modules, you know, hook them together, you know, and, you know, off I go. Well, it turns out that that's not quite the case. If you go to the Puppet Forge today, you will actually find, you know, Hadoop-related modules. The majority of them are dated 2010. Uh, there is, I think, one that is dated 2012-ish, you know, beginning of the year. And the trouble with Hadoop is that it's rapidly evolving. But before I jump into that, let's actually, like, take a step back and figure out, you know, what is the typical way, you know, how would you actually consume an Apache software to begin with? Because Hadoop and all of the projects that I showed on, you know, previous slide, they happen to be Apache Software Foundation projects. Now, Apache Software Foundation is a great place to develop your code. What it's not specifically so great about, and it makes a point of not being great about it, is providing you with sort of binary releases of this product. So what you get out of the Apache Software Foundation is a tarball release, right? You know, there is a source code management system to go with it, but the uh, artifact that ASF produces for every single project is a tarball release. That's a fundamental fact of how the foundation functions. It's a non-profit organization that has a charter of pr producing tarballs. I mean, that's an ele elevator pitch, right? Source tarballs. So the way you would use a source tarball, you know, used to be pretty simple, right? You know, like you untar it, you CD, you know, you configure, you make it. Oh gosh, I cannot make install because I need root account, and now I so do make install, and it's all in the you know wrong place. It's like it's just really complicated. And people came up with a different way of using Apache software, uh, which actually made ASF you know really happy because you know all of these Linux packagers came up with a way of just packaging that software and making sure that it's well integrated with Red Hat or Ubuntu or SUSE or any other flavor of Linux. So what you would do instead, you would just sudo apt get install and off you go. And it would actually ask you, you know, what you want to do with your configs and if you have some local changes to the configs, it'll manage it for you. It'll install the users, it'll register the services. Oh, and by the way, on different Linux systems, there is, you know, different uh, service management facilities. There is like, you know, ENED, there is apps. It's like packages take care of that and that's just great. So why is there no apt get install Hadoop, right? And there is no apt get install Hadoop to this day. Now Ubuntu sort of provides some level of that, uh, but even that is not really working all that well. So four reasons, and again, you know, me sort of spent two years, two years and a half almost uh, at Cloudera. I think you know these are two, four fundamental reasons. Well, first of all, Hadoop is still in a very, very active development, right? And by active development, I don't mean just you know bug fixes or rapid sort of you know changes to the stuff that you don't notice. I literally mean the fundamental APIs that would completely break your applications, right? You know, Hadoop is that level of technology. If you want to play with it, that's the price you pay. You know, you kind of have to track it all the steps of the way. So just like Chad was, you know, saying in his talk, like when you go to the Linux distributor, it's like going to, a, you know, a mega market, right? You know, yes, they do have sushi, but it's kind of packaged, you know, a couple days, you know, months ago, right? Same thing with Hadoop. You know, you do get Hadoop, but it's a version of Hadoop that's like, you know, 018. Nobody's like not even aware of that version anymore in the uh, ASF. Uh, second reason, Hadoop is Java-based. Hadoop is actually, uh, in my opinion, one of the first sort of fundamentally successful, like widely successful, you know, Java project. To me personally, Hadoop was one of the things that completely sort of changed my outlook on Java. And I spent, you know, all of my career at Sun, pretty much all of my career at Sun, and my outlook on Java was like, meh, yeah, it's fine for the Java applets and, you know, stuff, but you know, all the server software must be written in C++. Well, no. But the trouble that it brings is that Unix is fundamentally not ready for packaging Java software, or actually sort of managing Java software. It doesn't know what to do with the Java software. Unix is really good about managing your uh, SO files, you know, shared object. It has, you know, like really nice ways of, you know, delineating the APIs and having version symbols in your shared libraries and, you know, stuff like that. None of that sort of is even in the uh, making for the uh, jar files or war files. Like, how do you actually make sure that, you know, you have the system that can have different versions of log4j, right? You know, like, no real answer. Now then, Hadoop is also a fundamentally distributed application. It's a distributed, and again, I call it a strongly distributed application in the sense that every single bit of this ec ecosystem has a really high chance of interacting with every other single bit of you know, this e ecosystem. Like you cannot just pretend that all that matters is a state of a single node. It just doesn't work that way. And Hadoop is way more than HDFS and MapReduce these days. It's all this other project that I, sh oh, sorry, that I showed to you guys. 
so what ASF is doing about you know, fixing the situation? Well, there are a couple of ways. You, know, you can take a project by project approach. So you could say, okay guys, you know, since Linux distributions are not capable of running as fast as we run in ASF, you know, sort of revving up our source code base, let's actually take it onto ourselves to maintain all of the system uh, integration and system management software that sort of is needed, right? So essentially, let's make every single project release packages for all the operating systems, right? And we all know that it would be a huge task, right? You know, you guys at Puppet Labs know how difficult it is to package for the gazillion of, you know, different Linux flavors, right? You have to do that because you have to do that, but there is a tremendous amount of, you know, energy that you spend on it. But you could sort of pose that question. The trouble with that is that ASF developers are fundamentally not interested in maintaining that sort of code. So best case scenario, and that happened at Hadoop, you know, with Hadoop once throughout, through, the, through its evolution, uh, even if you have like package management code sort of pushed into the trunk, it starts to bit rot because it's just fundamentally not what the project is all about. Like ASF is all about community in a sense that, you know, if there is no community around the source code, the source code doesn't matter. It's just the fundamental fact about, you know, how the software gets developed. You can sort of take a developer-centric view and say, well, you know, it's edit compile debug cycle anyway, so let's deal at the level of just raw jar files and tarballs. Like, you know, let's just link tarballs around and, you know, install them in slash tmp or slash opt and, you know, we'll be just fine. Because, you know, developers do it every single day. That's how they develop software. Well, true, yes, and, you know, you can try doing that. But again, it doesn't really accomplish the kind of integrated, you know, system level view that we would like to have as, you know, DevOps people sometimes. And uh, all these questions, like, you know, difference in distributions and packaging. So where is the valid user lib exec, right? You know, like, how many of you do actually happen to know whether it's a valid path on your Linux system, whether it's a path that your distribution sort of honors, right? Ra raise your hand, like, for sure. Do you, anyway, anyway. Well, see, that's exactly the trouble, because, you know, on Ubuntu, it may be the path. On Red Hat, it might not be. So, like, you have to care about all these little details. And again, you have a combinatoric explosion of dependencies, which is like a dependencies is, you know, either like any place you look in our industry, dependencies hell is upon us because, you know, we like independently version software, but we don't like to deal with, you know, how it all fits together. So here's a million dollar question. You know, we have Hive, which is again like a top level, you know, SQL type of a thing on top of Hadoop. And it happens to depend on HBase, and it actually happens to depend on, depend on two different versions of HBase, which is already kind of fun, because they're kind of sort of incompatible in certain ways. Not major ways, but, you know, the ones that Hive actually has to care about. And HBase actually depends on three different versions of Hadoop. You know, now it's actually four different versions of Hadoop, or five, I haven't checked. But a million dollar question is, you know, if you untar the tarball that Hive developers will give to you, that's the stuff that you would download from the Apache Software Foundation, because they're nice people. They want to give you something to, you know, jumpstart your sort of Hive experience, right? And in ASF lingo, that would be called a binary convenience artifact. It's like, this is the best we can do, right? You know, this is the stuff that if you're a developer could just, you know, make you up and running, you know, on your local machine, you know, quickly. So just untar it and, you know, you'll get some Hive, you know. We're not guaranteeing what Hive it is. So what's inside LS, uh, you know, what's inside uh, lib subdirectory of Hive? Well, what's kind of interesting is that it's not that it's a completely different version of HBase. It's not a version of HBase that it's in their, you know, that is in their IV file. It's 089, which like, what, what, where, where did that come from? Well, I don't know. But what's even more surprising is that it has two different versions of log4j. And you know why? Because they probably happen to depend on two different components that require two different versions of log4j. The trouble, of course, is that, you know, on a class path, only one will get picked, and log4j is probably fine, it's a reasonably stable component. But if it's something like Hadoop itself, and you have two different versions of Hadoop, you know, libraries on your class path, well, bad things will happen. So this obviously doesn't work. So that's where the project that I'm working on, BigTop, comes in. So remember what Debian did to Linux, right? Remember, you know, good old days when it was just, you know, Linux 0.99 and we all had like floppy drives and we would recompile our kernel. I recompiled my kernel in the cross-compile environment because I didn't actually have a live system. So, you know, that was kind of fun. And, you know, you would put it on a floppy disk and you would boot and you would like, okay, well, it's a kernel, it boots. Now what do I do with it? Well, you need to recompile some, you know, uh, dynamic linker capabilities. And then you can like, okay, so at least I need bash. So you would put bash on that same, oh, the floppy, you know, space runs out. So 
it was really fun, but you know, Linux wouldn't be in the position it is today if we would be still slinging floppies around, right? So all of a sudden there was this, you know, thought that, okay, so let's make it really easy for people to actually consume the Linux distribution. We might take some choices away. Like I had great fun deciding what version of, you know, dynamic linker I want to put on my floppy. You know, that was great fun, right? You know, that choice is taken away from me by Debian developers. But the flip side is, I get something that I can just install on my system or boot in my VM, and I don't have to care about any of the incompatibilities between components that they actually have to care about, right? You know, that's all taken care of. What's also great about Debian is that it has a secondary effect. So Debian is a fundamentally open source, uh, sort of FSF, you know, endorsed distribution of Linux, right? It's a, it's a quintessential open distribution. It's a distribution by developers, for developers. It might not, not necessarily be the best distribution for the end users, you know, today, although I would claim that, you know, I happen to actually like pure Debian. What it enables, it enables a secondary level of distributions, which essentially say, okay, now that you guys have taken care of all the basic requirements, like we don't have to care what version of GCC, you know, should be in the system. We now can take care of the use cases that our user base puts forward. So then there is Ubuntu, which says, well, we care about UI. So we'll invest tons of you know, time into making Unity better. And by the way, the rest of the system, we're not really that interested in. So Debian is just fine for us, right? You know, there is Nopix, which says, you know, we want to have a Linux distribution that just boots uh, from the live media and you know, you're productive with it you know, from you know, within like 10 seconds or something, right? There is DSL, damn small Linux, which cuts down the size of the distribution. Like, there are all these secondary effects. So what the project that uh, I'm working on called Big Top, Apache Big Top, uh, is trying to achieve is achieve that same Debian effect for the Hadoop uh, ecosystem. So we're trying to build a project that then all of these vendors, which sometimes happen to be in this, you know, what I call co-petition sort of mode where they cooperate on the common source code in the ASF, but then they compete on the basis of, you know, customer use cases and, you know, they have different sales forces. And, you know, they essentially sort of share the same pie. All these guys can actually draw on the commonality uh, of the truly 100% Apache sort of open source distribution of Hadoop and build their own distributions. So uh, Cloudera is doing it today. So we have, you know, Big Top out there. It's now a top level project at Apache Software Foundation. Uh, Cloudera's distribution CDH4 beta, beta 1 was the first distribution of Hadoop that was 100% based on Big Top. We do have put additional stuff just like Ubuntu, you know, puts additional stuff on top of Debian. But again, the common base is all taken from Big Top. So Hortonworks, one of the key sort of competitors in the Hadoop space to Cloudera, actually also uses Big Top, uh, but selectively. So they select, you know, certain pieces of the system and use it. So th there is some talk about, you know, companies like uh, EMC Greenplum, this new sort of initiative that they have also using Big Top. So uh, what's there in Big Top? Very quickly. And then I'll get to the stuff that's really sort of important to you guys and Puppet and the rest of it. Uh, there is build and packaging infrastructure. So we essentially produce RPMs, Debian's, you know, pretty soon Tarballs, Homebrew, Mac ports, you know, for all of the Hadoop ecosystem projects. Uh, build infrastructure for VirtualBox, VMware, uh, we support gazillion of different, you know, Linux systems. There is a Puppet deployment infrastructure, which is, again, why I'm here, you know, talking to you today. There is integration test infrastructure, which is how we make sure that the entire thing is working together. And then we're really huge believers in uh, continuous integration. So we have a dedicated Jenkins instance that is 100% focused on the integration and system aspects of Hadoop projects running all the time, so every single change that we do, you know, goes through the uh, integration change. Well, at least it's supposed to. Uh, all of the URLs, I'm sure, will be available once slides get published, so, you know, you don't have to scribble them down. So, now that I mentioned that we actually developed some of the uh, Puppet code, the answer must be Puppet, but from Big Top, right? Well, it kind of is. And before I explain to you why it isn't, really, uh, this is also an explanation of why we don't publish to Forge yet because we're not sure whether what we're doing is exactly what needs to be done or whether something else or maybe something, you know, some different approach needs to be taken. So fundamentally, the issues that we're struggling with when we're deploying a big sort of fully distributed system like, like Hadoop is, uh, first of all, well, what's the level of, you know, division of labor between what you put in your packages? Because remember, Big Top has this nice, 
property of controlling the entire sort of life cycle, right? We produce the, the packages. So we have this you know, opportunity to actually decide what is the split between functionality that goes into the packaging code and functionality that goes into the puppet code. And even that I'm not actually 100% sure yet. So these are the things that I would really love for those of you for whom it's like, yeah, these are the issues we're struggling with in our environment too. I would really love for you to, you know, uh, find me after the presentation, so maybe, you know, during the lunch break and talk to me about, because, you know, I have my opinions. You guys might have some opinions. I would love for Big Top to do the right thing, and maybe, you know, we can sort of uh, find some common ground. But let's actually very quickly go through what's in packaging, right? You know, fundamentally, you know, DevOps people assemble systems from packages and configuration management, right? You know, that's like the fundamental tools of the trade that we have. So what's in packaging? Well, the great thing that packaging provides to you, two greatest things are probably dependence and tracking and build encapsulation. So build encapsulation, you guys probably shouldn't be worried about too much. It is the, you know, SRPMs and SDebian's purview. It's like, how do you actually make the source code that's part of the source package, you know, to compile into the binary package? But it's a great way for us to encapsulate all of the build, you know, idiosyncrasies uh, of the Hadoop ecosystem projects. Dependency tracking is a god-given because, you know, RPMs and Debian's have evolved to support these systems where you actually have to express your dependencies on other parts of the system in all sorts of interesting ways. Uh, there is a bit of, you know, Java packaging thrown in, you know, these days uh, by various Linux distributions. Uh, I'll talk about it uh, a little bit later. There is a file layout, so fundamentally package will lay out files on your file system. There is user creation, so package can, you know, package code can provision users on your system. And there is service registration, so package basically can explain to the system that these are the things that you need to run on, you know, certain run level, and you know, these are the things that need to go in, you know, different run level. Does it really work, though? Are you guys happy with the level of sort of packaging support that you get from your, from your Linux distribution? You probably are, because you know, it's most of the time it's kind of like it's fine. It's it doesn't bother us too much. I mean, I don't curse at my, you know, Ubuntu doing wrong things. You know, well. Occasionally I do, but you know, not at the level of packaging. When we start talking about Hadoop, it again, it all just completely grows in proportions. So Java packaging, well, Java packaging for Hadoop sucks because we have to deal with so many different you know, versions of Java software that we cannot possibly rely on the upstream distributions providing us the jar files that we need. So that's off the list, right? File layout, well, Hadoop, again, happens to be a system where individual bits and pieces can evolve at different, you know, rates, right? Worse yet, because it's a so highly, uh, you know, it, it's a system so highly under development, you're never sure whether this is the version that you need or maybe this version will break you completely. So what typically happens, what, you know, like the number one uh, requirement from the customer base that we have uh, in BigTop and at Cloudera as well, is like, how can I make sure that I can do side-by-side -side installation of the packages, right? So that even the file layout, like even where the files go, is completely configurable in the sense that I can install, you know, maybe two or three versions of components, you know, have some mechanism like alternatives to switch between them, and then decide whether this is the one that I want. Well, modern Linux distributions make it possible but extremely difficult to do that. Try installing two different versions of GCC on your system. You will, you will find exactly what I'm talking about. So even the basic, basic you know, ingredient of package building, like file layout, is not really working that great for Hadoop and systems like Hadoop, right? User creation, again, you know, we have to integrate with the rest of the world. So user creation, what does it mean? It does mean that you know, I can run a script, but will it provision you know, LDAP and Active Directory user? Uh, likely, maybe not. So again, it's something that we have to take care of. Service registration. So uh, for Hadoop, it's kind of interesting because services that we run on Hadoop actually need to be orchestrated. Now, you could turn around and say, well, that's just a deficiency in the system itself. You know, you, they don't have to require the orchestrator, external orchestrator. Uh, they just have to be fault tolerant, you know, fully fault tolerant. And some of them are, but some of them are not. So it's not as simple as registering your daemon at a certain run level and like you are done with it. With Hadoop, when the daemon starts, might actually affect the rest of the system. So you actually have to have something in, in the mix that would orchestrate the entire thing. And then we're talking about, you know, like petascale distributed systems, right? You know, scale, Yahoo runs at 5,000 nodes, you know, at least the time, you know, I was working at it. Uh, it ran a Hadoop cluster of around 5,000 nodes. Maybe, you know, the size grew large, larger, I, I don't know. But it's a tremendous 
uh, requirement even on your Puppet infrastructure, because try scaling your Puppet master to 5,000 nodes. Again, I'm not saying it's impossible. It is actually possible. Puppet is a good piece of software, but it's something that requires a lot of planning, and maybe there is a better way of doing it than you know, just a straight rollout of the Puppet master. I touched uh, a little bit upon you know, deployment orchestration, that you can just expect your services to be registered at a certain run level, and just like you're done with it. So imagine a situation where I have a host key tab, right? You know, provisioned on a certain node, right? And then there is something that is dependent on that key tab, right? So, well, I can sort of pull that trick off using stored configs, but what I really, what I'm really trying to express, I'm really trying to express uh, a dependency between two things that happen on separate nodes. And I really don't have any good DSL support in the Puppet itself for that as well. So again, these are the things that make it really difficult to apply you know, the knowledge that you get from your Puppet courses and you know, uh, training to Hadoop type of deployments. These are the things that you really have to figure out how to do. And the good news and bad news is that the whole industry is trying to figure out how to do them you know, in a nice manner. Uh, one of the, again, sore points for systems like that is uh, rolling upgrades and rolling rollbacks. You want to roll, uh, upgrade your system in chunks. Hadoop cluster is something that needs to persist 24-7. In a typical environment where Hadoop clusters run, you cannot just take the cluster down, upgrade all the nodes you know, to, a new to a new version of you know, components, you know, bring everything up, and hope for the best. You just cannot do that. You have to operate under the constraints that every single time, there might be a piece of the system that will be at a different version, and yet the system has to uh, work. It has to be highly coordinated. And Puppet, again, Puppet provides you some hooks for doing that, but not, not a lot. So with all this bleak picture that I'm describing, are we really back to tarballs and shell? Because uh, it kind of sounds like that. I mean, like, it sounds like you know, maybe Puppet is not even the right tool for the job, right? You know, uh, maybe, maybe it is tarballs and shell. Uh, so the questions that I ask you know, when I sort of view submissions and you know, suggestions for Big Top, it's like, at this point, I'm not even sure, and I'm totally looking for uh, feedback. At this point, I'm not even sure what's the good packaging system for Puppet, right? You know, you have your vendor-specific packages, which come from, you know, if it's Red Hat or RPM-based system, it would be RPM. You know, if it's Debian-based system, it would be Debs. But then there is this meta-packaging system that, you know, got developed out of frustration with the, you know, make-install cycle called FPM, and you could probably guess what F stands for. Uh, yes, it, the, the, the other two is package manager. It's just a thin wrapper on top of you know, uh, RPMs, uh, on top of the tarballs, that essentially produces you know, RPMs and Debians, but it's a very shallow RPMs and Debians. There are almost virtually no post or you know, pre-installation scripts that get thrown into the FPM produced package. So it's a very, very shallow packaging system. But maybe that's actually what's right. Maybe that's the level of granularity that we have to uh, assume when we are also throwing Puppet. And make no mistake, again, I'm not suggesting that Puppet needs to go. I'm just trying to figure out what is the good place for Puppet and what is the right place for Puppet in all of this mix. So what is the role of Puppet? So uh, I would love for Puppet to be coordinating the entire system. I would love for Puppet to stop having a view of just stamping very predictably, very reliably every single individual node, and maybe giving me stored configs, you know, so that facts can be shared and or so, you know, some information can be shared and whatnot. I really wanted to have something that would let me orchestrate the system. And that something, you know, like the fundamental aspect of that something is actually the DSL, right? To some extent, I don't really care how it is implemented, but I really want those, you know, uh, edges in the graph to be able to cross nodes. Maybe it's a pipe dream. I don't know. But if it is given to me today, I can guarantee you that I can use it for Hadoop deployment and you know, all the other systems like Cassandra and you know, fully distributed systems deployment today. Uh, converging an isolated node, right? You know, will it ever work for the distributed system? I think not. Like I'm starting to assume that no. So unless Puppet grows some kind of a you know, adjunct service or some kind of a maybe you know, partners with some guys, you know, who would actually provide orchestration, I think we cannot really, we cannot really you know, trick ourselves into thinking that just dealing at the level of a single node would solve it for us, at least not when it comes to Hadoop. So maybe a role, a good role for Puppet is just a building block uh, for an agent-based system, right? 
maybe what Puppet is really good at is predictively, you know, stamping out this information, maybe. And then there is a higher level system that orchestrates, you know, where each Puppet agent runs. And maybe that Puppet agent doesn't even talk to the remote server. So there is no Puppet master. Maybe everything that that, that Puppet agent needs to know is supplied to that Puppet agent uh, by the agent. So essentially, your Puppet agent simply runs, you know, Puppet apply, uh, takes specification, doesn't care where it came from, you know, doesn't care, you know, like everything is encapsulated in that specification and it's just fine. Maybe that's the right thing to do. And the more I think about, you know, Hadoop and how to sort of like structure my puppet sort of within the bigger or orchestration engines, I'm starting to assume that maybe that's the right place for it. So there is a mode of running Puppet which is called masterless. Again, it's based on Puppet Apply. It doesn't, I don't think it happens to be the most sort of wildly used, you know, method because let's face it, I mean, Puppet Master is useful. It is helpful. It's a single point of, you know, administration, but it's also a single point of failure and pain. So maybe removing it completely, if we have to go with agents, you know, base systems anyway, maybe removing it completely is the right thing to do. I don't know. Let me know. Again, I'll, I have the places where you can, you know, uh, join the project and, you know, leave your feedback and start the discussion if these are the things that you grapple with, you know, every day. Uh, but when I talk about agents, you know, even with agents, it's kind of like the question is, you know, what is the agent? What is the right agent for the agent-based system? Well, one answer is there is no agent, right? You know, we have this sort of SSH-driven based approach. And by the way, this is the way we deploy uh, Hadoop today in BigTop. And a lot of times at Cloudera as well. Uh, although Cloudera has a sort of separate product. Uh, the project called Were. It also comes from the Apache Software Foundation. And it's essentially a glorified SSH shell, right? You know, it will SSH into a bunch of nodes. You know, it has a mode uh, courtesy of Chad uh, that would apply, you know, puppet recipes to each individual node. But that's pretty much the extent of what it does. So maybe there is no agent. I believe it's an incorrect answer, but, you know, I still have to list it. So there is M Collective. M Collective is kind of a nice agent, but I don't see, unless I'm mistaken, I don't see a lot of sort of use of it as an agent-based system. It's kind of there, but it's not. So, like, we use it maybe to query some facts or, you know, maybe quickly do, you know, like puppet kicks type of, a, you know, thing or, you know something like that, but it's not really sort of like, it's not viewed as an agent yet. Uh, and then there are like full blown, you know, agent based systems with UIs and, you know, all the bells and whistles. So Cloudera produces Cloudera Manager, which essentially takes full ownership of the nodes in your cluster. It says to you, I will take care of everything. I will take care of scale scaling myself. I will take care of, you know, running the right code on the node. Just give me the IP addresses, you know, and I'll take it from there. So. Puppet doesn't exist in, in, in that mix, right? You know, Ambari, uh, uh, a sort of a Apache Software Foundation project that is, uh, I would say, you know, a bit of a competition to Cloudera Manager, uh, takes kind of similar approach. I believe that they used to use Puppet, but I think they're trying to phase it out now. So again, they're going with their own agent-based system. I also believe that these are sort of not quite correct approaches uh, because we, in my opinion, we have to be lazy, right? You know, we have to build out of the building blocks that exist. And I truly see Puppet as a really great building block. It's just not clear to me, you know, like what are the edges of the building block, right? You know, what is it that, you know, it is really good for and where I need to implement some, some other tools. So it's evolution, even in Big Top. So if you want to deploy Hadoop, I welcome you to, you know, check out the URLs at the end of the talk. I mean, you can go there, you can get all the Puppet recipes that we develop internally for sort of Hadoop deployment in Big Top. You can try them out in your environment, uh, but it's, it's evolution, it's not perfection. I, that's one of the reasons we don't publish them on Forge yet, because, you know, publishing on Forge is kind of an admission of like, that's how it needs to be done, and we are not sure yet, right? Actually, there is yet another reason we, not, we do not publish on Forge. Forge still lacks the uh, programmable way for publishing, and it either has to be integrated in our build system or we like, it's just too few of us to, you know, click through buttons every single time we do a big top release. I mean, we, it, it just needs to be automated. So I hear that, you know, that is coming. So once that comes, at least one extra barrier will be, will be removed. So what do we have in big top today? We have a very minimalistic, highly consistent packages. It's not quite FPM because, you know, FPM is really minimalistic. We do provision users. We do try to, you know, use alternatives mechanisms. We also try to fail gracefully in a sense that we recognize that there, there will be a lot of cases where we just don't know what to do, right? You know, we try to provision a user, but it somehow doesn't get provisioned. 
And we know that in cases like that, there is no reason to panic because there will be a higher level system like Puppet or Cloudera Manager or Ambari that will do the right thing. So our packages kind of like try to do the most that they can, but if you know, something doesn't quite work out, they try to fail gracefully. We still don't have Java packaging you know, figured out. Uh, as a project, we work with you know, uh, most of the uh, Linux distributions, Red Hat, you know, Ubuntu. We're trying to sort of be part of the conversation of what is the right way to package Java. So in Big Top today, it's just a bunch of symlinks, right? You know, we try not to ship the same jar file twice, and we try to rationalize where jar files are coming from. But a lot of times, we don't know the answer. So instead of shipping you know, gazillion versions of uh, log4j, you will see a gazillion you know, symlinks, because that's how the software expects everything to be laid out. We have pretty minimalistic Puppet code, which is you know, really straightforward package file service you know, pattern applied to Hadoop nodes. It is focused on being masterless. So we do not use uh, Puppet Master. Uh, we use War for internal deployments. And you know, we rely on things like uh, uh, Cloudera Manager if you know, packages need to be orchestrated in a more precise manner. And we do have box grinder recipes. So the nice thing about BigTop is that you can actually produce a distribution of you know, <clears throat> Hadoop that is available in your VM right away. So like you don't have to even install anything. It's just you, know, you boot your VM and you have a Hadoop. It's a pretty you know, constrained version of Hadoop, but it's enough for you to start playing. So what's the road ahead? Well, here are the three problems that I really would love to you know, have your input on how we can solve them together. Because again, BigTop is all about sort of community involvement. And I would really love to see you guys being part of the community. So the question number one is, what is, like, what is actually the right answer to the configuration management in a distributed system? So we kind of well, like, kind of used to ETC configuration files, right? ETC Hadoop feels right. But we do have distributed system at our disposal after all, right? You know, like, yes, there is a little bit of a chicken and an egg problem, right? You know, like, how do you provision the distributed configuration management system like Zookeeper, which can be used as a distributed configuration management system? Well, you still have to have some local level of ETC Zookeeper you know, config files. But once that is up and running, maybe that's the right answer to sort of pursue, right? And for those of you who are really curious, uh, Canonical guys, well, Ubuntu, right, you know, Canonical as a company, they actually have, um, they have an interesting way of uh, deploying software in the cloud called uh, Juju, Juju Charms, which use Zookeeper as a you know, backend for configuration management, somewhat at least, you know, for coordination. So they're already sort of exploring that approach, right? Does it mean that, you know, next version of Ubuntu that comes in 2014 will completely forego ETC configure? No. But, you know, for distributed systems, it kind of makes sense. So if you have feedback, if you're curious about Zookeeper, if you're curious about maybe helping bring up Zookeeper's module in Puppet, there is none today, and it would be really cool to have one. Because essentially, you can offload a whole bunch of configuration management, just, you know, files and, you know, that sort of thing to the Zookeeper, and then treat your local ETC files as a cache for the state that's in Zookeeper, you know, that sort of thing. So maybe that's the right way to do it. Uh, we are really interested in new kind of system packaging. So to address the issue of uh, rolling upgrades and uh, selective, you know, rollbacks, Cloudera is experimenting with this new packaging sort of system called Parcels, which is essentially a glorified tarball plus some metadata. And the rest is taken care of by the management system. So it's kind of like, remember how I told you, to me, the fundamental question when I administer the entire system is like, where does the packaging stop and Puppet begins, right? So Cloudera with Parcels answers in the following way. Packaging stops really, really quickly. All you need from packages is just bits. Well, a little bit of metadata wouldn't hurt, but it's just bits. So like once we're given the bits, don't even think about where they will end up on your system. It's just the bits. You give us the bits, we'll take care of everything else. So maybe that's the right approach. But again, maybe not. It's being explored right now. I think it's a step in the right direction. What I'm really fundamentally interested in, and this is totally pie in the sky, but that's why it's so exciting. It's like a, one of the moonshot you know, things that we have in Big Top. I truly believe that we're actually witnessing an evolution of an operating system, right? You know, it's like, it's like a change you know, from the uh, early day craze computers with all this you know, wiring going, you know, going in to deck machines that ran Unix and were standardized. And everything was kind of like networked by that time together, well, at least somewhat. 
And it was a completely game changer, right? So maybe we actually, I wish, I, you know, I hope that we're in that moment in time where we are actually seeing an evolution of a fully distributed system. And maybe Hadoop is the first example of it. It certainly has all the, you know, uh, all the hallmarks of, a, of an operating system. It has its own file system. It has its own process scheduler. Like that's how Unix began, right? You know, so maybe we should stop pretending that we package for Unix. Maybe we should package for Hadoop and for distributed file systems. Maybe the right answer to all of it is Hadoop packaging system, right? HPS that will utilize HDFS itself. It's a distributed system, file system after all. That will create a state in HDFS that will be fully distributed because again, you don't have to be scared of HDFS. It's not like your NAS filer where you have to constantly worry about, you know, like scalability issues and everything else. HDFS is designed to be scalable. So maybe we should stop pretending that local state matters for anything but cache. If you feel as passionate as I do about this, you know, you are certainly welcome, you know, on Big Top, right? You know, it's like the stuff that I would love to have. Like, this is the stuff that I spend my weekends, you know, thinking about and, you know, prototyping because I would love to have Hadoop packaging system. It's just like, it's cool. Uh, and finally, orchestration. So to puppet or not to puppet? I think for orchestration purposes today, I don't have enough building blocks in puppet, but there is enough building blocks in puppet sort of as a uh, stamper of the state of each individual node. So as, as an orchestration edge engine, I want something else. And the choices today are, you know, Cloud Air Manager, Apache Mbari, which is still incubating, so it's a, you know, early stage project. There is another interesting sort of development in all of this, uh, there are you know, a couple of guys uh, who have a company by the name of Reactor 8, so here's the URL, uh, that take this different approach that you know, we now have this, all sorts of systems like you know, Puppet and Chef and God forbid CF Engine, uh, but all of them lack orchestrator. So let's build an orchestrator that can orchestrate any of the systems that you know, do configuration or change management, right? So it's a very, very interesting approach, and you know, they actually have some interesting ideas on how the DSL needs to be sort of enhanced you know, for the types of relationships that I alluded to, you know, to be expressed. So I definitely recommend checking them out. Um, I think I will skip again. I have quite a bit of slides, and uh, I typically give this you know, for about an hour or so. Um, let me just jump straight to where we can, you know, where we can meet again. <laughs> so, the big top needs more of you. If you're in a position or if you expect to be in a position or if you're just curious about Hadoop and big data and hey, it's the wave of the future, by the way, right? Don't forget, like it's, you know, we're putting it all on our resumes. So if you're interested, join our meetup. You know, we have a meetup in Silicon Valley that's going on under the sort of umbrella of uh, Silicon Valley hands-on programming events. Uh, there is the URL, so just go register, you know, we run sort of meetup type of, you know, sessions uh, and sometimes even training on big top and, you know, everything big data. Uh, if you are interested in contributing, these are the areas that we would gladly take contributions, you know, the key areas. So we need more infrastructure for build and testing. So if you're a company that experiments with Hadoop and you have some spare servers, you know, cycles of the servers or, you know, maybe a bottomless EC2 account, we would love to talk to you. Uh, if you happen to be one of the Hadoop vendors, don't hide your tests. Let's admit it, guys. You all test behind the firewall. That's why your stuff doesn't break, right? We all test. So let's have a common repository of tests. I mean, that's one of the things that I loved about uh, the initiative that Linux had early on when they had a you know, Linux sort of test uh, initiative. You know, IBM was a big, big player in that. And I think that helps the whole ecosystem stabilize much quicker. And if you happen to be one of the Apache software uh, developers who you know, see your projects being packaged or managed by BigTop, help us by just validating your releases using BigTop. It's pretty easy to build custom distributions. So BigTop is a set of source that can be utilized to produce a distribution, but it's also a source, right? So you can basically take BigTop, customize it, and produce a distribution of Hadoop you know, called my Hadoop or, you know, Roman's Hadoop, right? It's real easy. So if you're one of those developers, use BigTop to validate your component against everything else that we have in BigTop because a lot of times the bugs are in uh, integration between components, not components themselves. Apache software is pretty good about, you know, unit testing and the software components sort of inside are pretty well tested. And finally, contact, you know, we have a home, uh, of course, uh, at the, uh, uh, at the uh, Apache. 
we have you know hangout places. Uh, Big Top is on Freenode, so we have you know user mailing lists. You know my email address uh, is over there, and that pretty much concludes my presentation on time, which is which is pretty pretty exciting. So questions. Yeah, this is a great presentation. Actually, you covered most of my questions already. Uh, but I had a question on, uh, in general, about the distributed systems you're referring to. So the Hadoop happened to be one of the examples. I, I don't have a lot of depth in the puppet. But my question is, instead of ca focusing on one application at a time, can we come up with a, a generic framework that can handle the distributed systems? Because Hadoop happened to be one of the examples. There are other things that are happening as we speak. And then once, let's say, like you said, people jump in and then solve the Hadoop problem again, you know, start all over with something else. Maybe we, can, we should take a step back and then come up with a generic framework that can solve, you know, multiple domains, if you will. That's, that's an excellent question. Uh, I think uh, it is now started to slowly happening. So I also happen to be a member of the Apache uh, incubator project, right? So I see, you know, the new projects being donated to the Apache Software Foundation of, you know, people bringing new ideas to the ASF. And the way that it happens with ASF, you actually have to go through the incubation, you know, period where you demonstrate an ability to sort of have a stable community around your project. And what's really exciting is that I see a lot of projects that aim at solving exactly what you've just said, right? So they aim at abstracting away certain aspects of you know, managing a distributed system and providing just the building block. So one thing that I don't quite like about Ambari, although again, it's a member of the ASF family, so like I'm happy with it, but I think they're taking a wrong approach, right? They're trying to solve the entire problem of how to manage a distributed system instead of coming up with building blocks that we can all then you know, sort of rearrange in all sorts of possible ways and solve the problems that near and dear to us instead of like them forcing a single way of how a distributed system needs to be run. But there are good examples. There is a project that you know, I happen to be actually a mentor of called Helix, uh, Apache Helix, uh, that came out of LinkedIn. And it essentially is a building block for a state machine that goes across different nodes. So Puppet, to a certain extent, you know, is a state machine that converges onto a certain state of your sort of graph, right? Now imagine that across different nodes and an orchestrator that is built on the idea of converging every single node based on that global knowledge. So that's what Helix does, right? Uh, they are already used by quite a bit of you know, projects within LinkedIn. Uh, there is a growing interest in the Apache family to use them. So it's a good example of how somebody is taking an, taking an approach of just pro pro producing an extremely valuable building block and letting the community play with it and figure out what needs to be done. Any, any more questions? Again, actually, like, what, what I'm personally here for is so that we can have like a powwow, you know, at the lunch table or something, and you would all share your experience, you know, at pain deploying Hadoop, and you know, like we would all figure it out. Yeah. So, but yes. Mm -hmm. Will you comment on a uh, map R, map R uh, approach in terms of that to, to enable the community to play uh, practice on Hadoop? So uh, the question is on MapR. So MapR is also a distribution of Hadoop. I think uh, fundamentally, Cloudera, Hortonworks, MapR, you know, all the other distributions, they're fundamentally similar uh, in, in, in approach. MapR happens to have the special sauce that is they don't really package HDFS as it comes from Apache. They have a complete re-implementation of HDFS written in C++, but it's, they claim that it's a uh, drop-in replacement. So you can just you know, take Apache's version of HDFS, you know, put MapR's version of HDFS in, the system works. But fundamentally, except for that fact, they're fundamentally the same. It's a distribution consisting of packages that you have to have something to manage, right? You know, they have a bit of a management software just like Cloudera does have, you know, Cloudera Manager, but fundamentally it's exactly the same approach. So if it works great for you, I mean, if you just want to have a, you know, reasonable size of a Hadoop cluster and it's not your primary job to constantly evolve it, then Cloudera, Hortonworks, MapR, you know, these are all fine choices. If you happen to be one of the Hadoop users who actually, for all sorts of reasons, have to keep up with Hadoop development, I don't think that you can today you know, come to any of the vendors and sort of 
be satisfied, right? Because you kind of have to keep up with upstream every single day. You may actually run bleeding edge versions of the software, and you, ha you better have a management system, you know, building system, your build system, you know, automation system that would allow you to do that. So if you happen to f fall, you know, into the second category, then BigTop might be the right answer for you. Not for the fact that we also produce packages, because BigTop, after all, is just a distribution as, you know, Cloudera, Hortworks, and MapR but for the fact that we also have all of the software that enables you to produce those packages and enables you to manage your Puppet code, right? So then you are a consumer of BigTop, but from a very different angle. You don't just get our packages and, you know, forget about the whole thing. You actually kind of like you are co-developing BigTop. And there are companies that are completely transparent about their developments of BigTop, so they submit patches back to us. Trend Micro is a great example. So they had a deployment of BigTop behind the firewall, Precisely because they were in a position where they couldn't go to any single vendor, they had to be on the bleeding edge of development, so they used BigTop for managing the internal distribution. Now, the internal distribution that they had was completely closed, in the sense that they had no interest in sharing it with anybody. But all of the additions that they did to BigTop, they were nice enough to share with us, and BigTop 05 is better because of that, right? BigTop 05 has certain members of the you know, Hadoop ecosystem, like Giraffe, just because Trend Micro was nice enough to donate code back to BigTop. So if you happen to be that type of Hadoop user, just treat BigTop as your project, right? You know, we would love to have you. If you happen to be the first kind of Hadoop user that just wants the sort of the cluster, you don't really care what version of Hadoop it is as long as it satisfies your POC, then go with any single vendor, you know, do a shootout, you know, figure out what's great for you, and, you know, go, go, go with any single vendor. Like, I work for Cloudera, so, you know, I would love for you to pick Cloudera, but again, make, make, make your own mind up. They're all fundamentally the same in, in the approach of how the software gets managed.